All right. Well, as people continue to join, I'm just going to run through a quick couple of housekeeping items. So thank you. Um, welcome to the second annual Preservation Delaware Conference. This section is called Beyond Section 106. Uh, my name is Alexander Tarantino. I'm a PDI board member. I'm also the chair of the Education Committee. Um, so thanks everyone for attending and a big thanks to our sponsor TetraTech for their support. Uh, before we get to presentations, like I said, just a couple of things to remember. We're going to get through all of the presentations first, and then we'll take questions at the end. So if you have a question for any of our presenters, you can use the Q&A function, which is the little button that's located at the bottom of your screen to ask your question. Um, if you're having issues with Zoom, you can also get in touch with us by using the chat feature. Um, so select presentations will be available on PDI's website and YouTube channel after the conference. So if you're interested um, in rewatching or if you weren't able to make um, a presentation, you can watch it after the fact. And lastly, I just want to invite you all, if you aren't already a PDI member, to please consider becoming a member. Your support really helps us to further preservation efforts in Delaware and to put on events like this one. So we'll also put information about membership in the chat box if anybody um, might be interested. So as I mentioned, this section is called Beyond Section 106. So Section 106 of the National Historic Preservation Act and its implementing regulations under 36 CFR Part 800 requires federal agencies to consider effects to historic properties that may occur as a result of projects they fund, approve, or carry out. So many practitioners and members of the public rely on Section 106 as the main method to protect or preserve historic resources, but we have to keep in mind that it only applies if there is a federal action. So the presentations today are going to explore some other methods to encourage historic preservation, including ordinances or programs at the state and local level. So first up, we have Rebecca Mills. Uh, Rebecca, if you want to turn your, your video on so we can all see you. So Rebecca is a second year law student at the Charles Widger School of Law at Villanova University, where she's studying cultural heritage law. And today, Rebecca is here to present on the Camden Historic District in Camden, Delaware. So welcome, Rebecca. Thanks for being here. Hi, thank you. Okay. Can you see my screen? Yes, we can. If you just, right now I'm seeing your PowerPoint. If you wanted to make it go full screen, play from start, I think that would be good. Okay. Um, you can share. Perfect, that looks great. Okay, awesome. All righty. Okay. So, all righty. So thank you so much for having me. And as Alex said, my name is Rebecca Mills and I'm in my second year um, at Villanova University in their law program. And I'm really excited to present on Camden, Delaware. So Camden is located in Kent County, Delaware, and has a population of 3,484 people. On one side, it's surrounded by agricultural fields. On the other, the highway connects Camden to Dover and the rest of Delaware. Nestled in between, Camden is a small town that is rich in history. For my presentation, I will discuss the importance of protecting Camden's historic and heritage district, along with the benefits of preser preserving the historic and heritage district. One National Park Manual starts off by saying, there are places in this country that we look at every day, but we never really see. At first glance, Camden is one of the places that is not really seen. It can be considered a rural town because there's no city over 50,000 people within the county and 45.6% of the land is used for agriculture. However, it's not far from larger towns and cities. In this mix of rural farmland and the very edge of city living lies a history that is a powerful view into the past. 
Originally, the Lenape people lived in Delaware along with the Nanakoke people in Southern Delaware. Camden was first developed in the 1780s when Daniel Mifflin sold land to form a farm hamlet called Piccadilly. The village grew quickly and by 1820 was home to merchants, innkeepers, carriage makers, and more. The railroad built in the late 1850s ran through the neighboring town of Wyoming, making Camden a commercial center for transporting peaches from the surrounding farms. During this time, while there were enslaved people in Delaware, Camden was part of the Underground Railroad and remained in the Union during the Civil War. However, despite its rich 18th and 19th century history, Camden is now a quiet and small town. Hey, Rebecca, just really quick. I'm sorry to interrupt. Yeah. I think, so the left side of the PowerPoint is cut off for us. Oh, okay. Let's see. Can you see it now? Yes, that looks great. Okay. Thank you. Sorry. Perfect. No, perfect. Okay, to continue on, Camden is a case study for historic preservation in small town. The preservation in Camden emphasizes the challenges and successes of local historic preservation. In the often overlooked central part of Delaware, Camden is a small aging town. However, its historic and heritage district are filled with important historical buildings telling the story of the Underground Railroad in Delaware. While many sites in Camden have been registered on the National Register of Historic Places, there have not been many current efforts to protect Camden's historic sites and the efforts that are ongoing are not technologically accessible to the general public. Although the population in Camden is small, it's growing faster than most towns of its size. Camden is in Kent County, and while Kent County is the smallest of Delaware's three counties, its population is expected to grow steadily and diversify. However, the town's population is also expected to continue aging. It is important as Camden keeps growing that the heritage district, historic districts, and historic sites are not forgotten. Instead, they can be a focus for increasing economic growth, community building, and more. More so, Camden is within 100 miles of DC, Philadelphia, Baltimore, and Wilmington. It's often stated that small towns are dying, but instead Camden is growing. And towns on the periphery of cities grew during the COVID-19 pandemic. While some growth might be temporary, other growth might be permanent. So in the town comprehensive plan for Camden, there's a section that had an update to re recommend consider removing the heritage overlay district from the town's zoning code. The removal of the heritage district in Camden could have a negative effect on the preser preservation of the town's historic structures. And instead of removing the heritage district, Camden should focus on encouraging the survival of the heritage district the historic district to benefit the town. Camden, Delaware does not currently have major federal projects that require section 106 review that would affect historic properties. Additionally, most of Camden's historic sites are already on the National Register of Historic Places. However, no new sites have been added to the list for the last 25 years. With no new progress on the list and most historic places already on the list, Camden needs to turn to other avenues beyond Section 106 to protect its historic sites. This slide shows some of the sites in Camden on the National Register of Historic Places, the Zion African Methodist Episcopal Church, which was originally built in 1845 and rebuilt in 1889 after a fire. When established, it was on the rural section of Camden on the edge of the traditionally African-American section of the town. The church also includes a cemetery, which includes the black graves of black Civil War veterans. The founder of the church brought his freedom and moved to Camden. The church was a haven for the black community and its social center. Also listed on the National Register for Historic Places, the Camden Friends Meeting House was built in 1805. Now it's the only remaining meeting house in Lower Delaware and still has an active membership. It is, the cemetery is the resting place of John Hunt, who's the chief engineer of the Underground Railroad in Delaware. The meeting house and its members were active in the Underground Railroad. Brecknock or Brecknock Park is also listed on the National Register and its original home dates to before the 1700s. In the 1800s and 1900s, addition to the home and more buildings were added for a mill, which was first built in the 1740s or 1750s, and it is now a nature center. 
There still needs to be more research done on Camden's history as a pathway for sharing a diverse history. For example, Thomas H. Owl was a Quaker miller from Camden, Delaware. He was born deaf and educated at Thomas Galladay's Hartford School for the Deaf. After his education, he returned to Delaware to take over operations on his family mill. More research needs to be done to uncover the story of John T. Jakes. He was an agent for Delaware's railroad in 1865 and a pioneer citizen in both Camden and the neighboring town of Wyoming. His daughter, Maggie Jakes, taught in the Wyoming Institute and more research needs to be done on women in the 19th century in Camden and Wyoming. Sharing Camden's history is a way to share diverse and often untold stories of history, including the stories of people of color, women, and people with disabilities. Although difficult to see on this map, its zoning laws, Camden has both a historic and heritage overlay district. The historic district consists of properties designated to the official map adopted by the town council. And the purpose of the historic district is to protect, perpetuate, and preserve the character of the buildings that make up Camden's cultural, social, and religious and architectural history to maintain and improve property values within the historic district and to prevent, to protect and enhance the town's attraction to residents and visitors. The heritage district protects, perpetuates, and preserves the character of the buildings that make up developments within the proximity of Route 13 and the alternative Route 13 with the town in order to set forth the character of the community and provide continuity along this area. The Heritage District is a much larger area than the Historic District and it also includes protecting the National Register's Historic District, which includes historic homes and the Watcoat Cemetery, which existed in the 1700s to the 1800s. In both the historic and heritage districts, there has to be applications for variants that are reviewed by multiple committees, and the standards are supposed to be narrowly construed to respect the structures deemed to have historic or architectural value, and broadly or loosely constructed for structures deemed to have little historic value, unless they would seriously impair the historic or architectural value of surrounding structures or surrounding areas. The Heritage District is the site of most of the development in Camden and the bottom right photograph demonstrates the development of the Heritage District is expanding as the town grows. The top arrows on the zoning map show that this development is in the Heritage District along with the yellow squares on the satellite map. While it's empty land before so no buildings were destroyed, the Heritage, Heritage District is meant to preserve the character of the community along this heavily trafficked area. The current development and continuing development measures should be taken to protect the character of the town and showcase the historic offerings. Camden, Delaware is protected through national, state, and local law. National recognition is found from the National Register of Historic Places, and it acknowledges Camden's historical past. The Freedom Network is also a part of Camden as the Friends Meeting House is on the Network of Freedom. However, more sites could be possibly included in the network as local history mentions other home where enslaved people were hidden on their journey. However, local law has the most day-to-day -day control of Camden's historic sites, and it's important to remember in the more rural setting, the town is the focal point and is the central meeting place, and preserving it requires efforts to preserve not only physical buildings, but economic opportunities and the social fabric of the town. At the state level, it doesn't seem like there's a lot going on and the partners in preservation planning for the future doesn't include Camden at all. And although it's located next to Dover and the first state heritage park, there's not much included on the Delaware history trail and in connection with this site. Additionally, in Kent County, four individual National Register properties and 165 buildings within the National Register District have been demolished. Camden is one of 18 National Register Historic Districts in Kent County, and it's hard not to imagine that Camden's Historic District will be impacted if this trend continues or has potentially already been impacted. At the local law, uh, zoning laws are very important and the town charter allows for the town to borrow money for public purposes. There are many benefits to Camden's historic and heritage district, including increasing local tourism, sharing diverse stories, and facilitating affordable housing that can be accomplished through merging historical programs with Wyoming, Camden's neighboring town, and strengthening local, state, and national law. Kent County is seen as a place to drive through 
and not a place to stop and see historic sites. Recognizing this fact, the Kent County Tourism Board has implemented a plan for the Delaware Quaint Villages with the tagline at your own pace, the Delaware Vi Villages Tourism Program emphasizes the benefits of visiting an area that is rich, is rich in history and small town living. Although there is less than half a million dollars a year on marketing tourism, the Kent County Board of Tourism has already seen substantial returns and expects to have an impact of more than 100 million in the next three to five years. Camden can use this infrastructure already in place with the Delaware Villages website and trip planning feature to emphasize the many different historic sites in the historic district instead of only focusing on a few. By connecting local sites to other locations, visitors may be more inclined to spend more time in the area, encouraging economic spending. Camden also has diverse stories that are sorely lacking on the National Register of Historic Places, and less than 8% of sites on the National Register are associated with women, Latinos, African Americans, or other minorities. Although some critics of historic preservation do not think there are iconic buildings left to save, there are whole histories left to preserve. While preservation has left out the stories of many communities, Congress in 2020 provided funding for a new grant program that would preserve and highlight the sites and stories associated with securing civil rights for all Americans. Camden's Delaware historical connection to the Underground Railroad provides stories of history that are important to share, even if the buildings aren't seen as grand. Incidentally, Camden shares many services with its neighboring town, Wyoming, another Delaware village. Frequently, the two towns and surrounding neighborhood are known as Camden, Wyoming. In fact, the two towns have even unsuccessfully tried to merge in the past. Wyoming was originally named West Camden and was built around the railroad. It has a large historic district with 380 buildings and 10 structures on the National Register of Historic Places. Both towns want to protect their historic sites and increase the walkability of towns and Camden strives to be the most walkable town in Delaware. The town center of Wyoming, its walkability is considered exceptional. As other services have merged, Camden and Wyoming should work together to protect their historic sites. They grew together as towns and it makes sense that people and visitors would be able to experience both the history of Camden and Wyoming instead of creating a modern divide. Both cities share common interests and should use Camden's Heritage District and Wyoming's Historic District to promote a walkable historical experience. The joint project could increase the public's awareness of both towns' history and benefit both towns while preserving historic sites and increasing walkability. The Historic and Heritage District protect the character of the town and they offer a chance to see the past and uncover stories that were forgotten. Local historic districts are one of the strongest preservation tools as historic districts can preserve housing and prevent unfettered gentrification. Historic and heritage districts can promote economic growth, increase visitation, and create affordable housing that's unique spaces for people to live, helping to increase their quality of life. Affordable housing is a big need for Camden and other small towns, and using historic and heritage districts to create affordable housing benefits all. Finally, strengthening the law, historic sites would be more protected. At the national level, the National Underground Railroad Network of Freedom Act of 1998 could provide special historical preservation distinction to sites included in the act, besides making preservationists go through the complicated National Register for Historic Places application, which is especially important because many sites on the Underground Railroad are told by local legend, not by the written narrative. At the state level, Delaware could improve its information regarding Camden to the public and provide additional protection for National Register of Historic Places properties instead of allowing hundreds of properties to be demolished. At the local level, the town charter could be amended to include a section on preserving, his, preserving historic sites to show Camden's commitment to protecting its history. Also ensuring a review for compatibility of new construction in the heritage or historic district can benefit both sites and construction that focuses on protecting surrounding cemeteries in the historic and heritage district and including cemeteries that no longer have structures associated with them. Strengthening preservation laws at all three levels would help protect towns like Camden from losing their historic sites. Thank you for listening. And I hope after this presentation, you don't see Camden as just this tiny dot on the map of Delaware, but a place that's a historical town that is waiting to share diverse stories.
Awesome. Thanks, Rebecca. That was really great and interesting. I know I am work out of Dover and, and live in Frederica. So Camden is, is not far and I always, it's an interesting place to drive through. That's for sure. All right. So up next, we have Mike McGrath, who is Preservation Delaware's president. So Mike managed the Delaware Agricultural Lands Preservation Foundation for over 25 years. And today his presentation will explore the links between ag land preservation and historic preservation. So welcome, Mike. Thanks for being here. Well, thanks, Alex, for the introduction. I'd like to take a few minutes of your time this morning to share with you a brainstorm that I had a few months ago. Uh, as president of Preservation Delaware, unfortunately, I've had the opportunity to see historic properties threatened or actually demolished, it seems like almost every week. And it began occurring to me that there might be some parallels uh, that we could explore uh, based on the agricultural lands preservation experience in Delaware. And so I'm gonna take a few minutes to uh, share with you some ideas for future discussion uh, about how we could preserve historic properties and archaeological sites uh, using some of the lessons and approaches from agricultural lands preservation. Agricultural lands preservation, can there be a parallel with historic preservation? So let's take a look at the big picture for public investment in easements. What is an easement? Well, an easement is a legal document between a landowner and another party, in this case, likely the public through state government, uh, whereby the owner of the property agrees to limit the uses of the property that would be permitted uh, without the easement in exchange for some consideration, usually the payment of a check. And so in agricultural lands preservation, uh, this is private property and it's voluntary. I think the thing that's different here that we found in Delaware, to be honest with you, is more popular is that it's not regulatory in nature. It doesn't have to do with restricting by law, the use of a property, but rather is an arm's length transaction, which is voluntary between private property and the public. There is involved a public good or an interest of the public in what is being protected. In the case of agricultural land, it's several things. It's uh, the protection of food production capability, of the economic value of agricultural production in Delaware, uh, landscapes, beauty, uh, what planners we like to call the interstices space between development and to stop development on land which has these values. It involves compensation to the owner. The owner is compensated uh, at a fair value based on an arm's length transaction. It's permanent. It's in perpetuity. It restricts the owner's actions. As I've said, in this case, owners in agricultural land uh, under easement would not be permitted to develop the land. They'd also not be permitted to neglect the land so that it becomes useless for agriculture. And the whole process and the selection process of properties is governed by a board. Well, for historic preservation, I would suggest we might do the same thing uh, to protect the historic house or the historic building owned by a commercial interest, maybe. Uh, we could have a voluntary program, again, to protect the public's interest in the property, which is its historic nature. Um, its value for future housing stock, perhaps, as Rebecca mentioned in her presentation. It might have to do with protecting the carbon footprint of the building already in place rather than demolishing it and replacing it with new construction with new uh, impacts to the carbon footprint. The owner would be compensated and in perpetuity, they would be restricted in their actions. They could not demolish the building. Uh, any repairs would have to be made according to uh, established standards for historic buildings. Um, and, you know, the building would have to be maintained and protected in such a way that there would not occur what we call demolition by neglect. And I thought, well, maybe the State Historic Review Board could be the governing board under a new set of statutes uh, that would create such a program. 
So how, how would the steps work? What are the steps like? Well, in ag lands preservation, you have to qualify the farm with a LISA score, meaning it has to meet a certain minimum standard for agricultural production, it has to be a certain minimum area. And then the property must sign a 10-year ag district agreement. It's a temporary agreement just for 10 years, but it restricts the uh, property from development. It's legally binding. It's recorded in the Recorder of Deeds office. It, under a current statute, it automatically review, renews after 10 years. But the significant thing is by entering that 10-year ag district agreement, the owners of the property become eligible to apply for an easement sale to make the preservation of the property permanent and receive compensation. Now, in historic preservation, could very well be a similar and parallel process. What qualities of the building or the archaeological site or a landscape that is historical, as again, Rebecca alluded to in her presentation, well, is it on the National Register? That might be one qualification, but also is it of local importance? Or maybe it would qualify for the National Register, but has not yet been selected or approved for that uh, category. Um, and then the property would uh, perhaps under a parallel program enter a 10 year, what I'm calling a state historic listing where no demolitions or and all, no demolitions could occur by neglect or by action. Uh, repairs would need to conform to the secretary's standards for uh, renovation or rehabilitation of historic buildings. It again would be illegally binding it could automatically renew after a number of years unless the owner decided to withdraw. But again, the key thing is that the uh, owners of the property would be eligible uh, to apply for an easement sale. So let's look at the easement purchase. Um, the Ag Lands Preservation Program uses an annual competition. Only properties in the Ag District, as I said earlier, uh, could enter the competition for selling an easement. There's an appraisal, which is the difference between the full market value of the property and the agricultural only value. Now this property, this uh, uh, value can be arrived at in a number of ways. Delaware's established a procedure uh, that is consistent from year to year. And then the owners, and here's the significant thing about Delaware's agricultural easement program. Owners make bids. Owners put in offers after reviewing the appraised value of the easement and offer discounts to the state government on a competitive basis. And in Delaware, successful bids are selected by the percentage discount below the appraised value for the easement, which the owner is offering to sell for. In other words, um, as I often said, uh, when I go into a men's store to look for a new jacket, I go look at the sales rack first. And this process that Delaware has followed with agricultural preservation uh, means that we've been very value oriented and then cash payments are made or even a term payment can be arranged. And again, in historic preservation it would be parallel. Only properties that are in the listing for the historical uh, listing for the perhaps 10 year uh, agreement. There's be a difference between the market value and the value after the restrictive easement is applied. Now that appraisals are always a combination of science and art, uh, but I think there can be a, a methodology established that's consistent uh, to determine what the appraised value of the historic restriction easement would be. Then owners would put in offers again after reviewing their appraised value and successful bids could again be selected by the percentage discount and there'd be a cash payment. Now let's look at the other benefits that could accrue in ag lands preservation uh, property taxes are also a benefit. There are no school or local property taxes on the protected land. Now, the houses and the farm buildings and the chicken houses and all the improvements to the property play, pay their regular tax uh, to the schools and to the local uh, jurisdiction. Uh, but no uh, taxes are assessed against uh, the agricultural land that's protected by a permanent easement and no real estate transfer tax either. Should the landowner decide to sell the property, uh, the state's real estate transfer tax is forgiven. And then there are significant federal tax benefits on the funds that are received due to the discounting procedure. The discount can qualify as a charitable deduction uh, on your federal income tax. 
And for many taxpayers that have uh, sufficient income to cover those charitable deductions, which can be carry forward for several years, that can be a significant advantage uh, above and beyond the check that's received. And then in state land use planning, special consideration is given to those lands that are permanently preserved. Well, the parallels would be similar with historic preservation. Perhaps you could set up a system in law where the school or local property taxes would be based on the reduced valuation after the easement is imposed. And you could also uh, include a provision that no real estate transfer tax would be levied against any property under a permanent historic easement. Federal tax benefits on the funds received to do, due to discounts would be the same. Uh, state land use planning, local land use laws at the county and municipal level could also reflect uh, special consideration for these permanently protected homes, buildings, or archaeological sites. And then finally, maybe uh, most uh, significant <laughs> alongside the title of this current session, is protection from state project impacts. Now, those protections could be at several different levels, but ideally it would protect uh, historic easement property from any adverse effects coming from a state-sponsored or state-funded project. So let me conclude. Some big question, questions, of course, remain. This all sounds very nice, uh, but as we know, uh, Delaware's agricultural land preservation, which was recently ranked number one in the nation by the American Farmland Trust, costs a lot of money. Uh, Delaware legislature has typically devoted $10 million to the projects each year. Um, and other monies have come in from federal uh, funds due to the uh, National Farm Bill. But the questions that really have to be answered before a program for historic uh, properties and archeological uh, resources could be, become reality in Delaware is do Delawareans value our history? Now, I will say that when we started the Ag Lands Preservation Program, considering legislation, we did poll Delawareans and found that they highly valued farmland, uh, agricultural production, and were willing to pay higher taxes in order to protect Delaware farmland. Can the same thing be said about our historic and archaeological resources? Well, um, I think it may very well be true that Delaware, Delawareans value these highly and would be willing to see their tax money go that way. Our historic buildings and sites valued as context for our quality of life. Yes, I think they are, and many Delawareans recognize this. A little bit of education too could go a long way. Do we appreciate the positive economic impacts of protecting historic resources? Well, Rebecca mentioned some of these, and I think uh, you know we can carry on with talking about many other ways that economically, Historic preservation uh, does benefit Delawareans and Delaware state government budgets um, and our quality of life here in Delaware. Some of the positive benefits I've thought about are uh, increased housing stock, uh, tourism, of course, uh, the, carbon imp the carbon footprint impact, um, you know, and there are probably many other things that an economic analysis would reveal uh, that maintaining our historic districts, historic buildings, historic landscapes, and archaeological treasures would benefit all Delawareans. So will Delawareans support using tax money to protect these resources? Now, these were the questions that had to be answered to begin our farmland preservation program in Delaware. But preservation in general, I think, remains popular with taxpayers and their elected representatives. So can we extend this kind of support to our historic resources in the first state? That's the question that faces us now. Thank you for uh, listening in, and I hope we'll have some questions later to discuss this even further. Thank you, Mike, for that. That is really interesting. And I know I was looking forward to hearing from you because I know you have so much experience with that program. All right. So our next presenter um, is Dee Durham. So Dee has been a champion of conservation and historic preservation in Delaware and the surrounding area for decades. 
Um, and since 2018, she's served on the Newcastle County Council and has led efforts to pass several ordinances that strengthen county code as it relates to historic resources. So today we're really excited to hear from Dee about some of these recent updates to the county code and what, um, what she and the rest of county council have been working on. So thank you, Dee, and welcome. Thank you so much. Um, let me see if I can get my screen share here. Hmm. One second, sorry. Okay. Okay. All right. Thank you, Alex, for the introduction. And um, I hopefully you can all see my screen. So give a shout out if, if it's not right. Um, I um, so yes, as Alex said, I was elected in November of 2018, and I actually um, ran for office largely to try to make a difference in the realms of preservation and conservation because. Um, I had been actually executive director of Preservation Delaware back in the 90s into early the early 2000s and um, just sort of watching from afar. I wasn't that involved in the early 2000s, but I could just, I was just frustrated that policy didn't seem to be keeping up with uh, what was needed in terms of protecting our resources. And, and as Mike mentioned, I think um, the citizens of this state and county uh, do care about historic resources and do want to see, um, you know, our resources protected. There's always a lot of frustration when a local resource gets demolished and, uh, but then nothing seemed to be done ab about, you know, kind of trying to enhance policy to prevent the demolitions. So one of the first things we did, I was working primarily with colleagues, um, John Cartier and Dave Carter, we established um, a working group and, and some of those attending today are on the working group, um, but it's steeped in the, the fact that, you know, preservation is people and the advocates, all of you who, you know, have heard from several already today, working on projects to save and restore properties, you know, you're all what make the difference. And, um, you know, an, an elected official can't, can't just work in a vacuum. Um, we need all of you to speak up constantly um, and, um, you know, work together to try to change policy and, um, and advocate for these resources. So this, this picture here isn't actually of the working group. I couldn't find a picture of the working group, but it just is to symbolize that the people are what make the difference. And so the, the work group has met several times and has been very critical in helping us to move policy forward in Newcastle. Um, so real quickly, uh, a lot of what we seem to do, I don't really think about it this way necessarily at the time, but it seems to break down into two categories, the carrot and the stick, in other words, incentives and, and regulations. So I thought I would just touch on some, first on some of the ordinances that we have passed in a couple years, um, one of which uh, reestablished actually historic, the county's historic tax credits, which had been allowed to sunset. No one had really even noticed. I think that's partly because no one was really using them. And, uh, and um, I know Betsy Hatch, the Newcastle County Preservation Planner is with us today and her contact information is on this screen as well. Um, to find out more information if, if anyone is interested about how to access that tax credit. Um, but I think what we all need to do is do a better job of talking about it and, and getting word out there about the fact that it exists and get some, some property owners using it um, in combination with both the federal tax credit and the state tax credit. And there are links to those on the Preservation Delaware website under the resources tab, if anyone is looking for those. And there's actually some other um, financial incentives uh, links for others on that website as well. Um, another ordinance that was passed, I guess in 2020, 
um, was a, a relatively small one, but it was regarding vacant properties. And it actually came about in a slightly different way, but one of the things that was incorporated into it was um, just to basically say, if you have a vacant property that you, that you are willing to put under historic zoning, if it's not already, and you have applied for permits to restore it or rehab it, uh, we recognize that that vacant nature of the property might continue for a while, but you won't have to pay the vacant property fee, which I think is a thousand dollars annually. And, um, you know, it just uh, sort of connects the dots and encourages property owners to put their properties under historic zoning, hopefully. Um, another uh, great program is sort of a, an incentive, sort of like the National Register of Historic Places. It's, it's more of a symbolic thing, but we established the Historic Marker Program, which uh, is run through the HRB now in the county, the Historic Review Board. So if, um, if you are a property owner that puts your historic property under an overlay zone, um, you are eligible for a bronze marker to put near your front door or wherever you might want it. And it's just a, our, sort of our way, the county's way of saying thank you for recognizing your historic resource. And, um, and it's, you know, as people come to visit that property, it, it might um, create some talking points about the history of the property and, and related topics of, of preservation in general throughout the county. So um, not because of the marker program, but just in general, I think because of um, highlight uh, an increased interest in historic preservation, there have been at least four properties that I'm aware of, Betsy can correct me if I'm wrong, that just in the last couple of years have been placed in the county's overlay zoning district as a historic overlay zoning district. Um, which does confer some restrictions, but also uh, some protections in terms of if, if you're looking to the future to try to make sure um, a historic resource has a little bit more um, watchdogging over it by the HRB, by the county in terms of code, um, code inspection, that sort of thing. And also if and when um, any expansion is, is proposed or, or rehab to the exterior. Um, I also just wanted to mention, this isn't something I'm directly involved in, but um, Betsy is. Um, the county does have funding every year to help um, National Register nominations, and these are some of the ones that have been uh, National Register nominations that have been funded in recent years in partnership with the county and um, the Center for Historic Architecture and Design at the university. So. Um, I just wanted to make sure that people are aware of that and, um, and might be able to tap into if you have a property that is not yet on the National Register in the county. So another um, ordinance that we actually worked on early on in my uh, tenure as an elected official um, came about because a property came before the HRB seeking to be demolished and um, the application for the demolition was submitted to the county in March, but for various reasons, the discussion at the HRB didn't take place until June. So three months, uh, many of you probably know, if not all of you, that the county HRB can delay a demolition permit for up to nine months, no more than nine months. So if in this particular case, three months had already gone by before the discussion ever took place. And part of the reason for the nine month delay is to try to create um, an opportunity for folks to talk together about alternatives to demolition and to talk to the property owner or the developer to try to um, see if some, some alternative to demolition can be uh, arranged. And um, so to lose three months was pretty significant. And, and uh, so ordinance 19080 just sought to sort of clarify um, that process so that we wouldn't lose time, that the nine month clock wouldn't start ticking until, um, you know, until it actually um, came before the HRB and had that initial discussion. So that ordinance actually led into a um, comprehensive ordinance 20071, which um, really did a lot uh, 
regarding historic resources in the county code. And I'll just mention a couple things. One was that when major plans come to the county, if there's a historic resource there, it requires that that area of the property, whatever, um, uh, um, sorry, can't think of the word I'm looking for, whatever property that, that um, uh, historic resource is going to be put in ultimately after the development plan is realized would be, ha would be in the H overlay. Um, and also a, a restoration plan would have to be submitted to the county. So um, it also secured uh, annual protections for um, our an annual review of H overlay properties in the county uh, inspection reviews, um, which there, there just needed to be some clarity there. So 20071 accomplished a lot of other things too. Um, it it, it uh, created some new categories for adaptive reuse of historic properties and, and um, loosened, I should, loosened sort of what was eligible for adaptive reuse, which hopefully will um, help some historic resources down the road find new uses um, in the future. Another ordinance that actually was just um, passed this earlier this year was regarding county owned resources, because I think um, well, I certainly believe and, and others agree that, that governments at all levels, not just the county, but the state and, and Fed as well, which is what section 106 is partly about, um, the, the governments should lead the way in protecting our resources and not, um, you know, we, we expect other property owners to take care of their properties. We have code, code inspections and violations. Well, we aren't, for at least some of the county owned properties, we aren't doing a great job and we should. We should be held to that same standard, if not a higher standard. So this ordinance just created the, uh, the requirement that any moving forward, not for buildings that we already own, but for historic properties that we acquire moving forward um, from its adoption would have to be placed under historic overlay zoning if, if eligible. And this, this is just another example of a county owned property, just Ivy side or the Bechtel house and um, a quote by local historian, James Hanby about basically saying the same thing that, that the government needs to lead the way in the properties it owns. I also just wanted to mention that of course, um, a large part of what we, you know, open space preservation and farmland preservation as Mike talked about, are very much intimately linked with, um, with historic preservation and preserving historic context. This picture is actually of a, a farm that the county acquired an easement on, a conservation easement on down near Port Penn. But um, those types of easements are obviously very important in making sure that our historic context as a farming community and the, the farmstead um, remain intact for the future. So these, I pulled these quotes from uh, the Newcastle County. Uh, County is undergoing a comprehensive plan update right now. The draft should be published soon. There'll be lots of opportunity for public comment. Hopefully you're all keeping an eye on that and will participate as that is released soon. Um, I'm sure there'll be, I think another, at least one if not more public workshops to solicit comments. But these are some of the comments that came out um, from from earlier workshops in the comp plan process, developing the comp plan um, for uh, the, the next revision, which will be adopted next year. And it's it's obvious the comments that, that the citizens really care about open space preservation and historic preservation. Um, and these are some polling uh, some polling data that came out of there as well. So uh, preservation and conservation are, you know, ranked number one with what the citizens support. So what's next? What are, what are we hoping to work on moving forward? Um, we have a byway ordinance. We've been working actually, it's been in the works for I think over four years now. Um, which would strengthen protections along the Red Clay Byway and the Brandywine Byway, the historic resources and scenic resources uh, on those roads, at least to get started. And the idea being that it would be expanded to all byways. 
Um, we're in the process right now of revising that, that ordinance, but we hope to have it back before County Council um, within the next few months. So that is something that's already in the works. Um, the, uh, we've been working with Tracy Searles, the general manager um, of the Public Works Department on county owned uh, historic resources and trying to get um, the uh, resident curatorship program uh, back underway. We just have a success story right now with the Jester House over on Grub Road, where a nonprofit is coming in to um, fit out the interior after the county paid for all the exterior renovations. And so it's a, a public-private partnership that's working out really well at that property. And other, uh, there are other uh, programs, for instance, in Maryland that has a really successful resident curatorship program. Um, so we really need to learn from them and see what we can do if there's a way to use those concepts in, in other buildings that we maintain as well. For instance, the Bechtel House that I showed earlier is a, is a good example where the resident curatorship would make sense. Um, as I mentioned earlier, whoops, sorry, the um, 20071 ordinance did uh, deal with major plans that come before the county if they have historic resources. What I would like to do is also include minor plans because there've been half a dozen of those in the last year that have come before the HRB. Um, seeking subdivision um, and with historic resources on them. And I feel strongly that those historic resources should also be placed under historic overlay zoning. So that's something that um, is hopefully uh, in the works for discussion and adoption in the future. I think uh, many people would like to see, I mentioned the demolition process, permitting process earlier that is limited to just a nine month delay. Uh, over the years, there's been lots of discussion about, you know, how we could strengthen that. Is there the ability to deny demolition of his significant historic resources? Um, I think it, that requires a lot more discussion, but I think there is a desire by many to try to do something um, in that regard. Um, we are working hard to beef up funding and awareness and attention to both open space preservation and ag preservation. The county has just, um, the, the county uh, had a task force on these issues and has just recently um, established boards that will deal with both of these two separate boards. Um, so they are actually uh, soon to be underway and um, County Executive Matt Meyer has put an increased amount of funding for both of these categories in this year's budget and next year's budget. So that's that's great. And we hope to keep that going into the future. Um, so we're definitely working on, in that area. Um, as I said earlier, I think we do need to spread awareness on the availability of tax credits at the county level and the state level um, and, and perhaps work with the, the State Historic Preservation Office to do what we can to simplify that process and make it easier for people to use. Um, beyond that, of course, as, as Mike uh, addressed, uh, there never seems to be enough money for anything for the carrot side of things for, and as opposed to the regulatory side of things. So, you know, are there ways to develop more funding sources um, and incentives that will help us all preserve the historic resources that we all care about. Um, those are my thoughts for today and I'm happy to, to take any questions. Thanks very much. Awesome, thank you so much, Dee. I know you all are doing a lot of great work there. So it was wonderful to have an update. Um, all right, so let's see, I was just going to invite all of our presenters to turn their video back on. I think everybody is ahead of me there, so thank you for that. We do have some questions coming in. I've been trying to kind of organize them here, and I think actually I'm, I'm excited because I think between um, with D and Newcastle County and Camden being in Kent County, maybe we can have some, some good dis discussion on what, um, if anything, those two counties might have in common or might be able to learn from each other. Um, but so let's see. So we have a couple of questions in the Q&A that Rebecca did get to, but there is one 
So um, Barbara's question, Rebecca, about Camden's, the historic district, and if they have a preservation review process, or are there specific regulations or guidelines? Did you want to just talk a little bit about that? Sure. So there is a review process for um, historic sites in the historic and heritage district um, that have to go before the architectural board and then potentially the board of adjustments. However, one of the missing pieces is that new construction doesn't really fall under the standards of review. And so now there's been a lot of development in the heritage district that doesn't have to go through this same process. And also a lot of information in general about historic preservation in Camden and this process aren't um, kind of accessible if you Google Camden's town and look on their website. And so a big problem is just the accessibility component. If you wanna be involved or if you wanna know inf more information, you really can't easily find this information um, on this small town's website. And I think that makes the process longer and more confusing. And that might be something that Newcastle is better at or has more resources and could share information with Kent County and especially the small towns in Kent County. Thanks so much. Um, let me see. So we have actually a couple of, of good questions um, specific to archeological resources. So I know we had one, one come in um, for D, but then Rebecca, we've also had some about Camden. So while I have you on, um, when you looked at, I guess, the current National Register nomination for the Historic District, which if I remember is, is, is quite a few years old at this point, how, um, if at all, are, are archaeological sites kind of addressed in, in that nomination or in the current sort of protections for, for Camden? Um, and then I guess if they're not, have you sort of come across any examples of how they could be better incorporated? Yeah, so a lot of the um, National Register nominations and applications are from the 80s and 90s, so quite old at this point. And there's some mention of archaeological resources, but really it's quite slim. It's focused on the buildings themselves. And I think that's one of the issues is that there's especially quite a few cemeteries in Camden and especially in small rural agricultural areas like Camden that have cemeteries with no structures and the cemeteries are kind of just there. And there's really not a lot of protection for creating open space around them. There's normally not a lot of signage or many people taking care of these cemeteries or there's not a lot of information available. And there's probably key archeological resources located around these cemeteries because there originally was a structure um, that are being ignored. And I think in Camden are not considered in the zoning laws. And I think that is one area where a lot of really valuable archeological information could be found and discovered and also needs a lot of protection. Awesome, thanks. And Dee, so I guess as a follow-up, we did have a question um, again about archeology. span um, And so I really, th I think the question in here is do you have any suggestions for how to get county planners um, and others to recognize archaeology as, as important and is better considered by developers? Um, they do give the example of the, the Gore count property in Newcastle County, um, sort of in the Newark and Glasgow area. Um, they're particularly concerned about, about sites like that. Um, can you sort of speak to that or um, tell us a little more about how the county code takes into account archaeological resources? I certainly, um, things that come before the Historic Review Board, um, the Review Board does try to do what they can regarding archaeological studies. Um, the Review Board uh, is mandated to have an archaeolog archaeologist on, you know, on the board. Um, I think Ordinance 20071 did uh, 
pay some attention to that, but um, it's certainly something we can look at again. Um, I can talk to Betsy about whether there are some other things she has in mind for um, trying to strengthen that component. Um, you know, unfortunately, I think the, the, the county code looks largely at structures. Um, and if something is not in a historic overlay zone, um, the HRB has, you know, can't mandate any anything, can't require a study. So, um, you know, that's, you know, that's an issue that, that we need to keep trying to strengthen um, because, it, you know, things come before the HRB and, and for things not in H overlay, um, their role is not regulatory, it's just advisory. And that, that's a problem. Understood. Yeah, it sounds like something to explore. I wonder if, if there are other sort of examples from either other states or other municipalities in other states that maybe have something we can look to. Um, oh, looks like so Adriana Moss in the chat did put a link to the city of Fredericksburg that apparently just established archaeological ordinance. Um, so that maybe would be a good example to look to. Thank you awesome. for that link. That's great. Um, and uh, uh, Wade okay. Katz, who was in the previous session, uh, served on the HRB for a, a, a long time. And, and I, I will catch up with him. I'm sure he might have some ideas. I think so. Yeah, we would be a great <laughs> resource. Let's see. So for Mike, I want to get you in on this conversation. We do have some good questions. Um, for you. So I guess I'll start with, we did have a question asking if, if that project or process had been started. I, I think the answer is, is no, um, but please, no, what, please correct me if I'm wrong. No, well, actually everyone on this call this morning is on the initial kickoff. <laughs> Perfect. So we're all special. I like that um well so yeah we'll, we'll put your we'll i'll put everybody's name on a plaque someday <laughs> the founding members yes so well can you sort of speak to if there have been any other similar preservation programs that have been put into place around the country um that would sort of you know that kind of take on the ag lands preservation methods but applied to historic properties no, not that i'm aware of now i haven't done you know, a lot of in-depth research. So I'll confess that right up front. But to the best of my knowledge, the answer is no. Um, and, and I think, you know, part of what's going on here is to understand, um, you know, exactly how these programs work. I mean, farmland preservation really hadn't been a long, around nationally that long, only about 40 years. Um, and and, you know, there's some sticking points there that I think are going to require a lot of working out. Um, and, and that has to do with the fact that, you know, agricultural land, it has to do with land, right? That's, that's there. As long as you farm it, it's not going anywhere. It doesn't move. It, it doesn't deteriorate to the extent that, you know, a building would. So I think one of the sticky things is how do you deal with the fact that we're talking about a building? in many cases. Um, and so that's one sticking point, you know, $10 million, that's another sticking point, right? I mean, you know, like when, when you start moving look, policies and, and, uh, and statutes, let's face facts, they don't cost anything other than, you know, political capital. But when you're talking about investing in buildings, now you're talking millions. Um, and, you know, and the last thing I would say that I probably didn't mention enough and because somebody mentioned archaeology a minute ago, is that um, it, one thing I think about this kind of approach, it can be applied to any kind of private property, right? Whether that's a building, commercial, residential, uh, an auxiliary building, it could be applied to land. For example, if there's an archaeological site, and, and I know a lot of Native American people are concerned about certain sites that don't get due consideration other than getting dug up, collect a few samples, and then go ahead and do whatever. When, when in fact, those sites may represent something very significant to that culture and to those people who are still part of our citizens today, right? 
Um, and, and so something like this could apply to that very easily, protecting land, because then the corollary with ag lands would be pretty close. But I think, you know, there's a lot of sticky questions here. And again, one of them is appraisal. Um, but I think, you know, you got to start the conversation. Uh, basically, it took five years to develop the agricultural lands statutes. And, uh, you know, that's, that's probably pretty quick. Well, that actually leads into, I think, another question that we've that we've gotten, which is, um, and what I was sort of thinking too is, you know, I guess what what would it take to pass something like this or kind of develop this legislation, um, and then with PDI as the statewide nonprofit, sort of what what can PDI do to advocate for that? Because I imagine that a big part of it, of course, is going to be sort of lobbying legislators and and getting their support, obviously. So, so the, the inter there's another interesting parallel there that I probably should have mentioned, but I'll mention now, is that the Grange, the Delaware State Grange, was probably the motivating group behind farmland preservation. I mean, you know, I was the chief of planning for the Department of Agriculture, but the, the group outside of government that pushed that the strongest was the Grange. Um, PDI could play a similar role. And, and I'll just mention a couple of steps that I think we have to understand um, all need to be made and they take time. And uh, one is, uh, as uh, Dee alluded to in some of her remarks regarding the county, is polling Delawareans. I think one of the most powerful things we did early on with farmland preservation was we actually did some statewide polls for about three years uh, asking pointed questions. Uh, we did this through the University of Delaware uh, demographics division or whatever they called it back then. Um, and, you know, it, it was what I call the Delaware Gallup poll. And we looked at, we took an, and it's expensive. It, it took some money to actually do in-depth polling that got valid numbers. And eventually we actually got valid numbers down to the state uh, representative district level. Um, and it takes a lot of polling. Um, but that's important. Number two, you got to identify a source of money. How, how are you going to, you know, where's the money coming from? Initially with ag lands, oh my goodness, we got so lucky. Uh, and I'll mention two well-known names. Senator Joe Biden uh, negotiated uh, a settlement on what was known as the escheat money uh, suit before the Supreme Court with New York State that brought $300 million in a lump over five years to Delaware and farmland preservation got 60 million of that right off the bat, right? Now I'm not anticipating anything like that, but uh, eventually the General Assembly saw fit to add $10 million a year to the operating budget, not the capital, but the operating budget. Um, and so, you know, that takes a lot of lobbying. Uh, but again, the polling then translates into legislative votes. And then the final thing I would say is building the model legislation took time. It took expert attorneys. Uh, in our case, Mike Parkowski wrote that statute. Um, and, uh, you know, similarly, you need to find a good lawyer uh, that can draft these kind of things and look at other states and knows the kind of legislation we're talking about in depth so they can write these things correctly. Understood, yeah, thank you for that. I think I see one quick question for Dee um, to clarify the, the Newcastle County ordinances. Do they apply for all of Newcastle County or sort of specific areas or where? I, uh, yes, I threw that in, I threw an answer in the chat too, um, that the all the ordinance, I or all the ordinances I mentioned apply for the whole county, um, but but you know they could be easily adapted for local governments or or other counties as well. So and I'm happy to chat with anyone if, if they want to get in touch with me about them. Awesome. Sort of I guess taking that um, a step further, um, I'm thinking about Rebecca's presentation about about Camden and sort of thinking of different opportunities. I guess to both Dee and Rebecca, um, 
do you think that, you know, sort of some of the ordinances and, and amendments to the code that Newcastle County has employed could serve as a model for either Kent County or maybe Camden as, as a municipality? And I guess D sort of having gone through the process, what, and, and Rebecca too, with, with the research that you've done, what do you think are sort of challenges to um, adopting ordinances or, or amending the code in that way? Um, I think a big challenge probably for Camden is having the ability to get um, the resources to review. Um, if there's more ordinances and you need more review to have the resources to have people review these projects and the money and research to go into the development, especially when the town is focused on economic development right now and growing um, just kind of basic uh, stores and restaurants that a lot of towns have. So they're not necessarily looking at trying to have lengthier processes or having um, review boards that are highly technical. However, I think they're very important and it could create an interesting town where new construction is sort of matched or tries to fit in with the preservation that's already happened in the town and could create an area of economic development because people want to come and spend money and stay in a town that is um, historically preserved and has this history that's accessible. Absolutely yeah it sounds like and I think it was maybe Mike that mentioned it but um, part of all of this, I guess, is really, uh, maybe educating isn't the right word, but kind of making people more aware of the benefits of historic preservation and sort of how, how you can expand upon that and sort of use that as an advantage as opposed to something that's sort of an obstruction or being in the way. So I think we have about a minute left. I know we got some very good questions here. I wanted to give all of our presenters the opportunity if you have any sort of final thoughts or things that you didn't get to mention um, to go ahead and, and do that now. Oh, we did get a, a in the chat just now. Um, Rebecca, have you sort of asking about the National Main Street program um, and, and wondering if that would be a good option maybe for Camden if you've, if you've explored that at all. I have looked at the National Main Street program just a little bit. Um, I think probably anything that requires matching donations is going to be difficult, which I know a lot of uh, National Trust programs do require. Um, and I think having enough people in Camden to support the process of becoming a national main street would also be a challenge, but I think it's a challenge that goes back to the fact that a lot of this information isn't accessible. There's not Facebook groups. There's not, you can't just join a mailing list um, and that there could actually be enough support for doing a program like the National Main Street or some of their specific programs for education, uh, but the community base just needs to be found. Understood, thanks for that. Mike, I see you unmuted. Do you have any final thoughts? Well, I, I just one final thought. It's a, it's a similar message that I sent when I was a teenager to my parents. And as president of Preservation Delaware, I'd like to say, having a great time, send money. It always comes down to money, it seems. That's the driving factor in, in, in a lot of this. Um, Dee, do you have any other final thoughts? I think uh, I might just echo what I said at the beginning of my presentation, which is preservation really is the people behind it and all of you listening and um, involved in all of these projects and these issues. Um, Preservation Delaware as the statewide nonprofit really needs you 
And so I encourage everyone to, um, to get a membership in Preservation Delaware, not just to support what it does as an organization, but also to keep in touch with us and with the organization so that as threats crop up, you'll be sure to get um, our, you know, our emails alerting folks to that and with opportunities to get involved or to speak up. And it's only through our collective voices that we can bring about change in policy or or maybe even if we're lucky, actually achieve what Mike has proposed or something along those lines. We're gonna need everybody um, to help us make, make something like that happen. And so I just encourage everyone to, to uh, become a member so that you can stay engaged in what we're doing. Absolutely, Dee. Well, thank you so much. I would say with that, I wanna be respectful of everybody's time. We are at the end here. Um, but thank you again to all of our, our presenters here today and for everybody attending. Um, we really appreciate that. We do have our last session of the day coming up at 1.30 on historic preservation and, and disaster planning. So um, please, if you're available, we'd like to see you again um, in a little while after lunch. You'll be able to use the same link um, to log into Zoom. So. Thank you to everybody again. We really appreciate your time and we'll hope to see you soon. Oh, cool, Rebecca, we've got, I don't know if you saw that in the chat, but um, somebody suggested place economics as a, as a good um, place to find data on preservation and sort of it's, it's linked to economic development and growth. Yeah, that's awesome. Be good to look at.